So we're very excited to uh, introduce today's um, uh, lecture, which is this part of this urban design in practice lecture series that's really highlighting, um, frankly, the diversity of forms of practice of urban design that we see globally. Um, we've heard from practitioners in Holland, uh, India. Um, we will have hear from uh, practitioners in Chile and Spain. So we're really getting a global view on um, conditions on the ground and frankly, new forms of practice, uh, ways that people are beginning to pull from just different disciplines to create this kind of transformative urban impact. Today, uh, we have a focus on the American context and I couldn't think of a firm that uh, could you know, describe uh, some of the, the challenges and opportunities uh, in uh, the American context than SOM. Uh, um, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, um, um, that was a firm that was founded in 1936 in Chicago. And we have two key partners from SOM with us today, Adam Semmel and Douglas Voigt. Uh, Adam and is the, uh, a managing partner and Doug is a partner in urban design and planning. And um, having a full disclosure, having worked with them uh, in, on the, in private practice, I can just say that they're just incredible professionals. Uh, that they have, you know, a deep knowledge of cities and what makes uh, cities and, and, and public spaces work. Um, and they have a very grounded approach uh, to bringing, bringing different forces together, all the forces that we see in play uh, in the American context from the private sector to the public sector to the table to try to advance, uh, you know, uh, better cities. Um, and so they've titled their talk city building as a collective act. And I'm very excited uh, to hear um, uh, their presentation today. So um, just as a note uh, in terms of just housekeeping, uh, this uh, uh, lecture is going to be recorded um, and will only be used uh, you know, uh, for academic purposes. And um, all students are welcome to uh, put your questions in the chat. Professor David Smiley will be moderating a Q&A session after Adam and Doug uh, complete their lecture today. So I would like to suggest that everybody except uh, uh, Adam and Doug go off camera for now, and we can uh, rejoin and share our cameras uh, during the Q&A session. So Adam and Doug, thank you again so much for joining and to speaking to and for speaking to this diverse group of, of urban design and architecture students. Welcome. Thank you, Kate. It's so great to be here with you all. Um, it's great to be back at Columbia, um, uh, an alma mater. I was there in the mid to late 90s in the New York Paris program, and I love coming back and engaging with students. But the beauty of the format we have today, the virtual allows us to have a truly global event. And it's a wonderful um, privilege to be here speaking with you guys today. Um, yeah, it's uh, kind of amazing. We can connect with 200 individuals, all interested in different aspects of cities. And really that's, I think our hope today is to share how as a practice, Kate mentioned, since its founding um, has always been focused on cities, but also in tackling the larger challenges facing society and doing so through the power of design, but also interdisciplinary practice. So we'll see where this goes. We're actually sitting in a lecture hall ourselves. Um, it's empty, but we're glad to uh, know there's 200 of you out there in the virtual audience. So today's talk we titled City Building as a Collective Act. And we're gonna, I think what'll come through our discussion today is the different disciplines, uh, political forces, economic forces, and expertise um, that are required and increasingly so as we look to the future to make our cities great. And a quick introduction about SOM and where we're coming from, this idea of the collective and a multidisciplinary approach is inherent to what we do as a practice. We were founded in, in 1936 by two architects and an engineer and quickly grew to include other disciplines like urban design, um, sustainability and conservation, interior design, MEP engineering, uh, and more. 
And today our mission is has stayed true uh, to that 1936 vision of an interdisciplinary firm. And we reaffirmed it three years ago with the mission statement you see here, a collective of architects, engineers, designers, and urbanists committed to shaping a better future. And so the, the DNA of this collective approach is one that we both grew up with. And um, uh, I think you'll see comes through in the way we work and the way we practice. Um, the firm has always been interested in not only leveraging that interdisciplinary expertise in meaningful ways to shape cities, but to create a format for working that is based both in uh, civic leadership, but also technical and design excellence. And having practiced for 85 years, you see projects like this, Canary Wharf, close to 40 years ago and its evolution along with the city of London and lessons learned in terms of the importance of civic infrastructure, of connectivity, how the concepts of movement inform and enhance how we design and further shape uh, the public realm within our cities and how those play an increasingly important role as we urbanize uh, throughout the world. And as you can see, this also begins to align with broader uh, city strategies and uh, London's goals as a global city. Um, but sort of within that is also the human dimension of public space, of open space, of working with artists um, and working with civic and government leaders to deliver meaningful uh, space back into our cities, such as the master plan we were a part of with Mayor Daly and continued to work with community leaders on shaping this important asset, not just for downtown residents, for the region, but really for uh, the entire country as one of these great civic spaces uh, right at the front door of our office in Chicago. And maybe as a point of departure is we were approached uh, two years ago by National Geographic to help think through a summary of what may be uh, in the future for cities. And I think given this experience and research uh, that we've all been focused on in our own projects is the ability to step back and understand that it's a more holistic um, attitude that's needed. And these 10 principles that you begin to see on the right um, are meaningful not only in sort of outcomes related to everything from ecology and infrastructure to culture, livability and energy, but also the areas of expertise that are needed as we think through, as Kate mentioned in the opening, uh, the future practice of urban design. And these ideas are as much about larger planning, ideas around land use, density and urban form, as they are about the architecture and the civic spaces uh, that people inhabit and interact with on a daily basis. And so why is this important? You know, clearly we're at probably one of the most uh, interesting and rapidly changing moments in our history. Um, the firm, as I've mentioned, we've all been focused on trying to answer these questions or at least contribute in a meaningful way to the conversation. So how can a firm, a design firm, play a role in shaping global urban development in a way that is more livable, more humane, but also addressing the challenges of rapid urbanization? How can we do so in a way that is also aware and responding to the challenges facing our environment so that we don't further um, break those chains, but we actually look at regenerative ways to rebuild our broader ecosystems. And that I think one of the things that's been most meaningful in my own career is understanding how connected everything is. And that mindset opens new possibilities of how to not only approach design, but how to apply research in a meaningful way. And perhaps as kind of a more philosophical question, is how can we as designers continue to contribute in ways that we adapt our human footprint uh, beyond just the projects we work on day in and day out. We know the challenges with urbanization, 
We also know the pressures it places on our environment and the resources available to sustain life. And I just love this quote uh, from a colleague that we've worked with uh, for many years that over the next seven to 10 years, this idea of ecology and urbanism is going to come together and shape the practice more than anything else. And it's how we build our cities, we create our energy, handle our waste, move our people, they all contribute to the resiliency of these ecological systems, or as he implies here, if done incorrectly, they further undermine and create breaks in the chain of these systems. And so kind of before we get into a summary of some of the recent projects we've uh, been working on, uh, what are the priorities moving forward? And perhaps you've heard about many of these in uh, presentations throughout the semester around ecosystems as well as the economy of cities. How does that integrate with social equity inform ideas around new approaches to urban infrastructure and that everything comes back to health and well being? And so we put together a series of slides. The way we've organized this is sort of a highlight of some of the themes we've been focusing on uh, through the lens of just project highlights, and then a case study at the end of a project both Adam and I have uh, been involved with for the last four to five years uh, here in the city of Chicago. Um, one of the things that I, I think is really interesting as urban designers is it's not solely uh, how we look at the land, it's how we look at the infrastructure and the integration with the natural ecological function of sites um, to support future urban development. This project on Chicago's south side, over 600 acres, was really challenged to think without any infrastructure, what is it that we should build? Could there be new ideas around district energy that actually uh, heat and cool all the buildings from the lake and return any uh, unused energy to the community around the site? Is there a way that every drop of water falls on the site is returned back into Lake Michigan and not diverted to the Mississippi River? And are there other ways using technology to get to zero waste, but also to enhance more fundamental requirements like access to healthcare, uh, job training and education in a part of Chicago that has very little uh, civic uh, and public amenities? And through working, again, this is the, around the theme of uh, working as a collective teamed with engineers in Copenhagen, we were able to actually understand the components to get to a more carbon neutral development. And this is specific to the US given the profile of energy demand, that if we could reduce the content, the carbon that's in the production of energy by 50%, if we improve efficiency on the user end by 50%, and then really look at the systems and ways to find efficiency, we could see a reduction in over 80% of carbon uh, within this development alone. And doing so in a way that creates great public space, rediscovers waterways and uh, introduces a new generation of mixed use buildings. Sort of on the other end of research, we were invited to uh, this hackathon in London that was really focused on the future health of the city. And sort of through the modeling and ability to look at a number of things simultaneously, we not only understood things like urban heat island um, within the public spaces, but also things around air quality. And sort of comparing and looking at the relationships between these two aspects of a city with the urban form and zoning behind it, it did start to ask questions about how to move forward in a way that puts another level of expectation um, around health, well being, and performance in how we design and shape our cities. Similarly, a couple of years ago, we were asked by the city of New York uh, and Cranes to put forward ideas for the future. New York City, I believe, is, at the time was around eight and a half million people. Um, the question was, how do we get to nine million? And we had a number of ideas. One that was very intriguing was uh, looking at the way to connect neighborhoods together and really the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. We all know the benefits 
um, by rethinking what happens within this right of way to introduce additional housing that can capitalize on existing infrastructure, but also uh, reduce emissions and create more meaningful public space. And it's these sort of provocative ideas that then lead to uh, future projects like the current work BRK is doing uh, in Brooklyn on uh, that segment of the expressway itself. And that leads to our next theme of transit-centered urbanism and mobility. And um, there's so much research and development going forward and in new investment we're seeing on equitable transit-oriented development and a deep understanding of the importance uh, that access and mobility brings to the economic development of cities, uh, the introduction, introduction of, of access uh, to different populations and fosters economic development. Um, so here's an example of the kind of project that can take over 20 years uh, to get built from the time we started working on it in the late 90s, uh, back when I was at Columbia, to, <laughs> to the first of the year uh, in 2021 when Moynihan Station finally opened um, it's a transformation of a old historic asset, the old post office in New York called the Farley Post Office, which really, because of the changing nature of the postal delivery service and the particular way the building was designed specifically for an outmoded way of delivering mail and the scale of the building, uh, was a block. Uh, towards further development and connectivity to the west side, but by transforming the building into a new extension of Penn Station, unlocked access, uh, not only to serve the 650,000 riders a year that use the station, uh, but create a new gateway and front door for New York City and connect uh, access to the far west side. And here's another example of a project similarly large scale. Here the private sector came forward and unlocked the potential for high speed rail in Florida a political context which otherwise would have been impossible to do high-speed rail in. Uh, the project's called Brightline, and it brings together not only the stations, but mixed-use development to help um, bring together the resources and make these things possible. So what you see here is the integration of residential living, high-speed rail access, uh, retail and shopping. All This is the Miami station, which is the anchor. And back in Chicago, where Doug and I both work and live, uh, we're developing a new station for, for the L. Some of you guys may have heard it. If you've ever visited Chicago, you can't help it. It's one of the oldest uh, major metropolitan stations in the world. It's noisy. Um, it's in some cases, it's not accessible. Many of the stations are not accessible and um, it's in need of upgrades. So station by station, the city is investing in major retrofits and the station at State and Lake is one of the most prominent in the city, hovering over the intersection of South State Street and Lake at the corner of the loop. And the work we're doing is going to improve accessibility, uh, safety, security, and create a great new gateway for uh, the L connecting the eight lines of the loop that run in the circle around the loop with the red line below State Street. As much as the old station was uh, outdated and dysfunctional, in need of repair and modernization. It also has a lot of historic elements which are loved by the city of Chicago. And you can start to see how some of those are being incorporated here in the design, salvaged and repurposed uh, to create a human scale and uh, bring, bring in the kind of old elements that give character and history of the loop, even as we introduce a new architecture that's very forward looking. It's a delicate insertion into a very tight urban context. And so a tremendous amount of engagement with the neighbors has been a big part of our process. And so we, when we talk about city building as a collective, it's not just a collective of designers, it's a collective of stakeholders too. So where you see the word restaurant and the four corners around the station, there's a hotel, 
there's actually a television studio. Um, there's an office building. Uh, there are two office buildings. And those four corners have had tremendous amount of input uh, on the way the station comes to ground, the degree to which uh, we coordinate to their needs uh, to make sure that even as we put this bold new station into the city of Chicago, it's a sensitive intervention. One of the key aspects to contemporary urban design is the importance of the process we put forward, which is as much part of the design uh, thinking uh, required when working in communities to be very thoughtful, to be equally creative and inventive in reaching out and engaging the many voices that uh, participate in the shaping of cities. And so we've done a lot of work in places like Detroit that have challenged us to look at that promise of how can design improve the lives of many. And in doing so in a way where it's not only equitable, but it's for the community in which it serves. And so this sort of graphic campaign uh, paralleled our planning process, which was really about we were brought in to help the future of your riverfront, shape the future of your riverfront. And at the end, our hope was that we could drop the why and that they can all say it's ours. And this sort of thinking has continued to a lot of recent initiatives we have been involved with, with Mayor Lightfoot in the city of Chicago and the Invest Southwest program focus on both the south and west sides of the city to look at very strategic but coordinated uh, public and private development opportunities, such as here in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood on Chicago's south side, one piece of city owned land uh, on the left in pink and a recent, I believe MacArthur um, funded opportunity for a new uh, urban incubator uh, project on the right side. And working together with community leaders, with the aldermen, but also church and other community groups to help look at ways to not only optimize the potential of the city owned land here on the left so that it contributed to the vibrancy of the public realm, but how it would be coordinated with streetscape improvements and the continued renovation uh, of the building across the street. So Doug mentioned the city's Invest Southwest program, and that's a great case study um, from a policy point of view that I think all of you would be interested in learning more about in terms of the way in which a city creates, hang on, I'll go back. The city creates an incentive uh, and a framework for investment in neighborhoods by the private sector in neighborhoods, which otherwise wouldn't necessarily see that kind of investment. And in Chicago, for us, that's the south and west side. So they, they've identified a dozen sites um, where, and, and the work you just showed, Doug, was part of the process of setting up the research and design thinking that went into identifying those sites and exploring what's possible, which led to an RFP process, which is unfolding across this year and the results of which we'll see over the next couple of few years with a huge emphasis, not only on the development in places that might not otherwise see it, but design excellence along the way. And so we were fortunate enough uh, to be selected for the renovation of this firehouse. You see uh, in, in the middle of the image, you know, this is a neighborhood called Englewood on the south side of Chicago, near the University of Chicago, but not immediately adjacent to it. Um, and building on the back of <laughs> what's called Englewood Square, just above and to the left of the firehouse. In the image, there's a Whole Foods there's some other uh, F&B and retail that serves the neighborhood. And we're gonna develop that. We're gonna take the area adjacent to it and start to develop community uses around it that celebrate um, local culture, local food and local entrepreneurs by creating architecture that allows them to um, uh, practice, grow their businesses uh, and create community around collectivity. And so, so these are some of the images that will be unfolding over a series of phases, starting with the renovation of the firehouse next year. And ultimately, this is what the final master plan looks like. I had 
previously mentioned uh, our work with the city of Detroit, uh, I wanted to go back to that for a moment because uh, when working on the two miles of riverfront from Renaissance Center here to the Belle Isle Bridge behind us, um, we found a number of opportunities to further explore. One was the importance of public space um, and more importantly, uh, providing access for youth um, and families to nature within the heart of the city and also seeing the benefit from the ecological um, function that could be restored, the creation of habitat, um, not just park space. And so this idea of bringing nature back into our cities was of great interest to us. And here in Detroit, we were very fortunate to partner with Michelle Devine uh, from France, uh, one of the premier landscape architects and thinkers uh, of our time. Uh, we've continued to sort of build on that research on waterfronts and a couple of years ago invited uh, by the city of Chicago with a number of other design practices to think about the future of our river. And uh, you all know the great work uh, along the waterfront um, in Lake Michigan, but the city has been rediscovering its internal waterways and it's been transformative just in the recent improvements but the idea to extend and link that further north and south along the river was of great interest um, to not only the mayor, but uh, to many of the businesses and residents that could further connect to a waterfront um, right outside their back door. And so we worked with not only um, engineers, but environmentalists, researchers uh, from the Shed and Field Museum, to understand the ways to improve not only the, the quality of the water, um, to find ways, as you see here with these water steps, to further aerate, uh, introduce oxygen back into the river, but also to create habitat. Um, and there was, a, there was a saying in one of our meetings, if we could bring the otters back uh, to the Chicago River, that would be a sign of progress. But it's also about connectivity. And knowing that as this continuous pathway moves along uh, the east side of the river, it enters into many environments that perhaps at one time uh, were there historically before industry um, came into the south branch of the river. Um, and sort of taking advantage of those unique moments and the hydrology that really helped shape many of these designs which leads me to another project. This is on the North Branch. Uh, right in the middle is Goose Island, uh, industrial um, part of the city that has been undergoing dramatic transformation, including a project uh, right at the north end of the island here, just to the left of the building with the dome uh, called UI Labs, which in itself is, is an interesting catalyst for further community investment and public benefit. But the project I wanted to share was what we call the Wild Mile. And it's the, what's on the left or the Eastern uh, banks of Goose Island, which was the man-made channel. And it was required to be navigable, but it was also incredibly um, polluted and many of the remnants of industry uh, still remain. And here's a great example uh, of the conditions today. Many different landowners, um, and also working with the Army Corps of Engineers, this required a more holistic view uh, to drive investment uh, in a strategic way and to see the connections. Uh, ways that we could not only extend public access, expand the amount of uh, space for wildlife uh, and habitat, but also create access to recreation as well as education. So that in itself is, is a very interesting exercise um, in looking at design within our existing cities. But what was very exciting for us was how our own studio um, became very engaged in working with the community and building these rafts, uh, these floating wetlands that are then stitched together. They create habitat above, they introduce nutrients below, some of them even grow food. And uh, we did this over the last couple of summers 
And at the same time, we've been working very closely with the schools in the area to not only understand um, and rediscover their own river, but to contribute to the greening uh, and enhancement of it for their own generation. And then uh, working with a non-for-profit in further sharing that information broadly. And the response has been incredible in terms of finding ways to apply this research to other cities that are looking to improve the health and livability of their waterways. Um, this idea of connectivity uh, can be at the scale of a, of a mile in Chicago or uh, opening up a block of private development in the city of Detroit, or it can be even broader ideas, bigger ideas of how to stitch public access uh, around the entire uh, island of Hong Kong and reconnecting the city with its with its asset. And so many times we have the ability as designers to stitch all of these uh, pieces together to show how the research for any one segment of this can connect with the next, prioritize where the gaps are so that the connections can be made to benefit a greater segment of the population and actually the livability of the island as a whole. Coming back to Chicago, there is an opportunity here too that we did this uh, over the last year through the pandemic of how to work with the city and the community on repurposing uh, the many miles of roadways that go through our city and primarily a focus on the west side. Uh, finding ways for meaningful new open space, as you'll see here, underutilized space below our L. Uh, to be not only new park space, new ground transportation for bikes, but also other programming opportunities that could then be paired with private investment in some of the uh, older industrial buildings, as you see on the left, or sorry, on the right here. Or taking one of our major thoroughfares and seeing how we could repurpose that right of way to create greater connection uh, as well as greater investment. Uh, for the neighborhoods of, of Lawndale uh, and many others on Chicago's west side. Which I think this is our last point before we get into our case study is as practicing urban design today, uh, it's really an opportunity to think at multiple scales and to see the connections between those. So a lot of what we've talked about is at the scale of a block or a city, but we also have been getting involved in projects uh, like here up on screen, working with the government in China, uh, the provincial mayor's 11 uh, district mayors on this 183 kilometer stretch of the Yellow River, the Mother River. And in some ways showing how an integrated approach to not only where development should occur, but where we should allow the natural connections uh, to be restored, perhaps ways to rethink land use policies so that it's more holistic in understanding the uh, functional relationships of, of water uh, and the ecological health of the river itself. And these things uh, are massive in scale, they're complex, but they can be applied to other shared resources um, such as the Great Lakes and a study we did about eight years ago that looked at the principles and opportunities for further collaboration on both sides of the U.S.-Canadian border, um, collaboration between cities, but also in how we looked at the shared resource within the boundaries of the watershed. Um, this is some, just some of the uh, pages from a recent document we produced uh, for the uh, Chinese government, um, but also the first phase of this new wetland park uh, that just opened last year. And you can see the importance of broader ecological thinking and sort of shaping uh, the future of our cities uh, in a meaningful and respectful way. Uh, and this applies not just to water, but also how we look at uh, air quality and ventilation. And there was a recent project in Chengdu, farther west in China, um, that found ways to actually improve air quality 
through not only the orientation of the grid itself, but through the urban form and working with uh, engineers, understanding ways we could create ways for the city to flush itself of pollutants and actually encourage flow that would re remove uh, pollutants, as I mentioned, but also help to cool uh, the city in the warmer months of the year. Oh, this is the last project. Um, and then in the Pearl River Delta, working with um, not only government leaders, but sort of local uh, farmers and landowners on strategies to um, plan for the future of these ecological resources um, and ways to do so that we have a new approach to engineering, uh, design, uh, and the landscape that allow the city to be more, uh, not only aware, but to put forward ideas that can be then replicated uh, throughout um, the region and what is one of the fastest growing uh, parts of the world today. So maybe just one thing to highlight is, as all of you are maybe asking, where does this stop? Um, <laughs> is I, I personally feel that uh, the role of, of urban design has evolved quite significantly. Um, it is an opportunity to not only connect the dots, but address the sort of complexities of uh, managing and directing growth within cities. So everything from sustainable thinking to equitable uh, investment, as well as the larger uh, functional, social, uh, and land use issues. Many times, the planner, though, is also in a position to not only bring the expertise of consultants, uh, experts in their own fields, but to help be a bridge between the community uh, and the client, which could either be the city or the developer. So this idea of working as a collective, city building as a collaborative act, is actually part of the expectation um, to act this way and to have a more holistic view and approach to cities. And to understand that what we do is just one part of the process, but it's a meaningful part in that it sets the stage uh, for future conversations around the principles and the ways uh, to reflect the values uh, of a community in design. So with our the final part of our presentation here, we'll try to use our Lincoln Yards project, which we've been working on for the last five years or so, um, as a comprehensive picture of how all those things come together from um, the idea that you can't look at anything at urban design through too narrow a lens. Uh, we want to create a kind of rich soup of everything that urbanism can offer um, in new development, as well as a respect for what's there and the history, the integration of the players and the process. So here we are, just the aerial Doug talked about earlier um, at Goose Island is, is about three, about two miles uh, into this picture. And we've just assumed our, our drone has pulled back a little bit and we're a little further away from the city, um, sitting between two neighborhoods on the left, you have Lincoln Park and on the right, you have Bucktown. And what we're looking at here is an industrial corridor, which has an industrial history that goes back to the beginning of the city. The river was of course used to, as an uh, industrial artery. And in the last several decades uh, became zoned specifically for that use, which meant that no development other than industrial uses could go on in this actually 760 acre swath, which is um, essentially about a five mile long uh, stretch of the city bounded, as you can see on the right, on the west side by a highway and a rail line, and on the left by um, an arterial road called Clyburn. And those together with the river created a number of uh, infrastructural uh, um, barriers to east-west movement within the city. And so what worked really well for industry for a very long time started to work less well uh, as these neighborhoods became more mature and the city was uh, deepening its development to the north. So we're facing south, it's the city's growing over decade by decade to the north. The neighborhoods are maturing, they're becoming more and more residential and mixed use. And this artifact of industrial produ production happening in the heart of the city while important for economic development started to become in conflict 
uh, with the idea of healthy living. And so the city over the last 10 years started to look at rezoning this 760 acre swath, which you see highlighted in here in green here called the North Branch Corridor. And you can see how many residential neighborhoods it touches on the north side from River North to the Gold Coast and Old Town Lincoln Park, Bucktown Wicker Park and Noble Square. If you know Chicago or you've visited, you may have experienced these uh, neighborhoods. They're incredible residential neighborhoods, each of them walkable. Um, with, with schools and playgrounds and um, different kinds of living and a pretty diverse uh, set of constituents. But the neighborhoods are separated by these industrial uses and the barriers of infrastructure that uh, supported the industry over time. And you can start to get a sense for that um, in this aerial view. As we come in closer to the site, you can see on the west, on the, on the right side, we had a steel mill on the left, on the east side, we had um, uh, another steel yard. We have uh, fabrication, we have leather tanneries, um, we have dumps. And um, on the north side, at the top of the picture here, we had uh, a big filling station. So there's a tremendous amount of environmental degradation and pollution on these sites, um, uh, he urban heat island effect, and a need to really reinvest first in the infrastructure to reclaim the site, clean it up, um, improve the quality of the earth and the river or the land and the river here, as well as start to stitch back together the east-west connections that are so badly divided by the infrastructure here on the site. And at the same time, an opportunity to pay attention to that heritage and start to think about ways through design interventions to hang on to the heritage and history of the site and make that evident in what's new, to preserve certain existing features that have, have been there for a long time that um, either signs or objects, industrial um, furnace elements that we've, even through the demolition of some of these buildings, we've been able to retain and will use again on the site going forward, as well as the character of the bridges and the river's edges. Oh. So this uh, wasn't a new idea. In fact, um, the sort of transition from industrial to more mixed use activities along this section of the river was something undertaken by the city in anticipation um, of, this, uh, of these series of investments, but also to help the city continue to grow and position itself um, in a way that um, takes advantage of these assets, but also helps to benefit the communities around them. And so there was the economic dimension of creating a new generation of jobs that would sort of replace the, the industrial uh, steel working jobs that were once on site um, to provide a significant amount of new public open space, not just connectivity along an expanded river walk, um, but also to really take on this idea of mixed use and uh, working with the city, the developer and the community, what are the right uses, but also what are the uses you don't want to see on site as they'll create further traffic or impact uh, in, around the surrounding community. And so really the, the best way to start is to look at the public realm. And, you know, as Adam had mentioned, uh, the industrial uses on site, LYN and LYS um, is for Lincoln Yards North and South, just the way we've referred to it. But these were cities unto themselves. They had very few public streets extend through them. And in fact, at this section, um, one of the most dynamic parts of the city, there's only three places to cross the river. And at those places, uh, you're not even allowed to access the riverfront because of the uh, industrial use and just lack of physical access. And so by starting with the public realm, something that you can control, even though the architecture will continue to evolve and take shape over time as it responds to the market, you want to get the connections in place. You want to get the sort of cohesiveness of the public realm restore the connections, not just east and west, but here, as you can see with Dominic Street, to find another way to move north and south to take some of the pressure off of uh, both Elston, Clybourne, uh, and those surrounding uh, corridors. And in doing so, 
create a new uh, attitude around complete streets, uh, shared streets. Um, things we've all learned from the pandemic are more and more uh, essential in terms of the quality of the public realm and designing these places uh, for people. As I mentioned, um, there was a significant focus on new public space, uh, two major parks, both north and south, as well as an extended river walk and other portals uh, and greenways that would connect from the um, street grid down to the river walk itself. And as Adam mentioned, um, Bucktown and Wicker Park, perhaps many of you also know the 606 trail, this, this incredible, uh, our version of the High Line that extends uh, two miles west, brings you here to the waterfront. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could bring it all the way to the waterfront so then you could bike from uh, to downtown. So biking from Bucktown to downtown is a way to commute through the city of Chicago. And when you're looking at open space of this scale, how you position it to take advantage of the views, to have solar access um, in the summer as well as the winter, but to also use it as a way to create value and address to uh, future buildings that frame these spaces. Um, finding opportunities to increase recreation that is so needed within this part of the city. Um, many families and their children have to travel miles outside the city just to play a game of soccer. But here now with these new fields, you can do that right in your backyard or to create smaller playground space, again, for families and to provide a welcoming environment for everyone. And at the same time, take those ideas around ecology, habitat, and access um, as we rebuild this entire riverfront uh, through Lincoln Yards. And once you get that in place, you can then really start to see the scale and the fabric. Uh, what we were focused on is a very walkable, porous, smaller scale blocks similar to Portland uh, or other great cities that have this intensity of, of a pedestrian environment. Um, in doing so, we were actually able to further explore with the architects and with the development team guidelines and approaches for how these buildings would front and interact with these public spaces. And so as opposed to things being closed off or blank walls, much more permeable, transparent, interactive. Um, that extended not just the design, but places for programming, year-round activation, uh, public markets, um, other community uses uh, within the ground floors of buildings, but also places that would be active at night. So it did become a place that had something for everyone uh, throughout the entire day, but also to take advantage of what's best uh, here in Chicago, which is this careful consideration of both the architecture and its relationship with the public realm. So this, um, this transformation of the old industrial site into what will become a catalyst for an entirely new neighborhood in Chicago does need to be supported by transit and multimodal transit in order to um, keep cars out of the site. Um, so we took advantage of um, the fact that our adjacency to the Metro line, but took on the challenge of the fact that um, a station of the capacity needed to support this kind of population didn't exist. We thought about how to bring together multi-modes like the 606 bike trail and pedestrian trail, the river walk, um, and of course the city's bus lines and other ways of commuting and moving around the city um, to create a new hub, a multimodal, a multimodal kind of nexus uh, where the 606 crosses the rail line and think about orienting the site so that this could become a new gateway to serve Lincoln Yards and the neighborhoods adjacent and beyond both to and from uh, other residential neighborhoods where people live and work and also the downtown. And so you start to see the vision for that here, how you have bikes and buses, uh, potentially the light rail that may be introduced and of course the heavy commuter rail on the right, all coming together. And the extension of the 606, which is coming in from the west, uh, it ends at the curly queue here on the left side of the image today, but the proposal is to bring it Again, stitching together and weaving across these infrastructural barriers today over the highway, under the tracks, 
connecting with the new station all the way to uh, the river walk, which will eventually connect to the downtown. And starting to look at how these undercroft spaces could be activated and programmed as new um, bike and commuter uh, elements are coming through. Can we find opportunities to take this section of space, which is really disused today, and enliven it with uh, activity, with food, with programming, with safe spaces uh, for people to enjoy these places within the city. And ultimately the vision for Lincoln Yards is the summation of all these things. Uh, it's 40% open space. It's another 20% of roads and other public infrastructure. It's residential, commercial, uh, retail environment that creates uh, a kind of mixed use energy around these open spaces around the river and all the uh, ways to get around that will one day uh, become a new neighborhood unto itself that is both at the intersection of these existing incredible historic neighborhoods of Chicago and an entirely new thing unto itself. And the last piece we wanted to talk about here was the way in which we communicate some of these things to uh, stakeholders, constituents, um, and groups, community groups that did play a large role in the development of the project and ultimately its embrace it being embraced by the city and its approval. So some of the things we communicate along the way as we're designing are uh, quantifying the economic impact, the kinds of jobs that would be created, both permanent, uh, temporary and permanent, the diverse participation uh, and commitments by the city and by the developer, uh, which can be actually written into the zoning approval and then track forward. Even if the developer decides to sell different plots of land, those commitments carry forward uh, through different contracts into the future. And then other benefits uh, in and around the site. So how these investments improve the city, not just for the neighborhood itself, but have a larger impact. So the extension of the 606, new roads and connections through vehicular bridges across the river, the extension of the river walk uh, and the multimodal hub. Ultimately supporting uh, a vision like this that brings together all the things we've talked about, uh, mixed use neighborhood, recreation, ecology, uh, and bit by bit, the transformation of the Chicago River into a continuous uh, amenity for the city uh, to serve the next hundred years. And that concludes our lecture. We thank you for, for listening and, and really uh, excited to hear your questions and comments and spend a little time in dialogue with the group here. Hi, everyone. Oh, Kate's here. All right. No, just thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to David Smiley to moderate the Q&A. Um, we have some great questions in the chat. David, take it away. OK. <clears throat> thank you. Um, am, I, am I coming across? I mean, my yeah. uh, video, that is? Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> wow, this is quite a. Um, in one sense, from the, the first half, a kind of global tour, um, which um, actually uh, raised a few questions and then kind of zeroing into um, the, I'll try not to call it Hudson Yards, I will call it Lincoln Yards, but I have yards, you know, as a new rhetoric of development. Um, so I think um, this is a good place to start because as a global practice, uh, one of our students, Tal, um, asks, um, how do you, how, and I'm gonna interpret this a little bit, um, when, you, you, when you have such, when, when, when the globe is essentially your, your, um, your, your site map, um, how do you uh, differentiate between local knowledge and your own experience, uh, your own research versus the specificities of place. I wonder if you have any thoughts or ways in which you actually go about mediating that kind of question. Sure, maybe maybe I'll start, Tal and, and David. It's actually a very important question um, because as a global practice, um, one of the reasons you're 
asked to come in is to share new thinking. But if it's not done in a way that is not only sensitive and respectful, but integrated with local vernacular, a local understanding of climate, as well as community and cultural dynamics, it's highly likely the project will not be successful. And so I think part of what uh, a way to answer that question is the process you design to solicit that input when working outside of your home. And we are very, very interested and keen to understand, like on many of those projects we talked about uh, in Asia and other communities, to work with local experts. So for example, on the project in Jinan, we've got a team of hydrologists, water experts, uh, and other environmentalists who are actually in Jinan, um, both through universities, as well as other local design institutes that are really the experts on how that functions and what are the things through our sort of collaborative dialogue can kind of move the needle in how we plan that important um, river corridor. So, you know, part of it I think is process, but I, I think there's also an, an openness to hearing new and seeking out new approaches locally that can be further applied to these projects. And, you know, we could go into many of those, but I think a lot of it does come down to a process and, a, and an openness to ideas. Yes, I would imagine that some places are, are easier for you to plug into than others. Obviously working in Chicago, you have a deep history there. And so working in, in China or wherever would um, present different challenges for local knowledge. It's probably um, <laughs> extremely, uh, I guess you have lots of people around who can, can help provide that, but it's uh, when we discuss globalization in the studio and we discuss how, how it's an opportunity, but also a problem, uh, I think the kind of ways in which you gain some local insight, or we all gain local insight, um, is very difficult, although it's probably more the norm for practice today that, that things are global. I think you have to immerse, there has to be a commitment to immerse yourself in understanding, in, to gain an understanding of the place. What is the DNA? Like when we first started work, we didn't share this project in Sydney, Australia. Mm -hmm. On our first trip, they asked us to stay in city for two weeks, to live and breathe the life of a Sydney cider. So we really understood what was unique. We went on many tours. We walked through many parts of the city and kind of replayed back to all of them what really resonated with us, but also what it's kind of as a foreigner coming into Sydney was seemingly authentic to that place. And that's a great discussion to have with this team to find the common principles and values that need to be reflected in the design. Another great example of that is on our Central Place Sydney project, which we also didn't show. It's a large um, urban and architectural development um, in Sydney submerging tech sector by Central Station. Uh, we just said, you know, we're going to team with a local design firm and ultimately together with the client found an indigenous uh, artist who helped shape the building. And we don't take the approach that, oh, it's going to be an artwork on the building. Actually, we brought to the design competition the idea that the artist would help shape the building and the concept of the artwork would inform the architecture. And truly, that's what's happening. Um, so that kind of approach to engaging a local team is really essential to working abroad. Um, even in different places in the country, uh, we discover that need to be working with a local who understands the place, um, can bring an authenticity to being from it and of it, and then to be truly collaborative uh, is essential. 
I think along those lines, uh, there are several questions in the chat that have to do with um, questions that expand from the, the concept of the local, which have to do towards uh, community stakeholders, who's actually living there. Um, and I think also uh, the question of gentrification. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, questions about what does community, how do you do community outreach or, or, or community um, kind of overlap with your, your, your professional teams. And um, as you say, you, you kind of live in a place for a couple of weeks, but um, what kind of, how do you, how do you get um, responses from the people who live in these places? And I think, um, you know, the history of, in the past few decades of urban development has become a kind of, uh, you know, there's a slash after the word urban development, which is gentrification and the kind of stratification of development for that excludes certain groups. And I would imagine that you have clients for whom that's a, that's both a, a, a problem to overcome as well as uh, perhaps many see it as the inevitable anyway. Um, and I was wondering how you handle that as a, as a kind of professional who professionals who are trying to create some kind of social equity in the way you go about your work. So there's actually a, there's a lot in that question. Um, first on sort of the building on what we were just talking about with the approach, you know, the, the public realm is public. It's a sign of the civicness of a city and of the values you just mentioned, David, of equitable, inclusive, and welcoming should go into how those spaces are designed. But it should also inform how the uses and the buildings that frame those spaces contribute to that sense of welcoming. And so, you know, in a lot of these mixed use projects, you deal with housing as well as uh, other commercial and mixed use restaurants, retail. That all needs to be considered if we're really going to address this topic of inclusive and, and equitable investment within cities. And I, I think there's a lot of discussion within the development community, as well as uh, city leaders in how to find the common ground to move forward. And one of the things we've seen, this was up in the city of Milwaukee, not far from us, was as we're doing a transit oriented development plan for the extension of a streetcar, both south and north of the city. The city was also working on anti-displacement policy that would go into, as Adam mentioned before, with, with um, what can be written into zoning, what can be put forward as part of the expectation prior to private investment in any of these corridors that are also receiving public financing. And so I think everyone's woken up to the fact that there needs to be greater leadership, um, but also <laughs> holistic approaches to addressing these in a meaningful way. The, the public sector has a huge role to play. Political leadership is essential to responsible urban design and development. If it's left to the private sector alone, then an understanding of all the things that really happen as outcomes of development isn't possible. And we do exist on the private side of that line. We're an architecture and design firm. And we sometimes work for cities and we sometimes work for institutions and we sometimes work for private developers. But in every one of these contexts, we would support and applaud and collaborate with the political, municipal, institutional leadership to take on these issues and have real dialogue around what's really happening as a consequence of development, to broaden the understanding, use the tools we have at hand today, and ultimately create um, a development response, a policy response, a dialogue and community engagement response that 
addresses an issue like gentrification in a way that's appropriate to what's really happening in that place as a consequence of development and likely has a history that long precedes what we're here to do today and a set of dynamics and community and culture around it too. Uh, we can't do it alone, uh, but we do always invite that, that kind of broad look at what's happening and what can be done to preserve as we move forward and um, support people who might otherwise be affected but not really be an, a party or a party with agency to what's happening around them. You know, David, if I can just add one last piece to that. And this goes to the project in Detroit to illustrate this point. Is many times, sorry, I'll sit a little closer. You, we also want to find ways to extend that benefit deeper into the communities, not just those that are directly adjacent. And so, you know, I sort of kiddingly mentioned connections can sometimes be a single block, but in the city of Detroit, we worked with the private landowner in the city to free up one block that allowed a bikeway connection to extend two miles inland to an existing greenway that would allow those residents in actually a very distressed part of the city access to the riverfront. <coughs> Without that, there was this barrier. And so, you know, finding ways to, to create that civic access to these public investments is a big part of the work and it requires, um, I think, a, a real interest to think beyond the boundaries or the scope that you're given and to understand the broader connections um, within our initiatives. I like the way you, you, you add that point, which is to um, look beyond the scope because that's kind of rule number one for us <laughs> is look beyond the scope. There is, you define the scope and chances are we're gonna tell you it's still too narrow. So um, I think the, that's a great, uh, an important lesson, uh, which it's easy for us to do in the studio. I imagine it's a little bit harder to do in the, in the profession, but is really a central way of uh, challenging some of the, the constraints, which is to, to take your scope beyond the given scope, uh, especially socially, because um, mm -hmm. you know that the ripple effects, not just of gentrification, but also you know waste streams and uh, electricity usage, um, these things are, aren't based on sites and streets and political boundaries. So um, <clears throat> I think that that's probably a key thing that we would absolutely agree with and we stress greatly. Um, another, um, <clears throat> just through, looking through the questions here, I had one more. Um, I think it's interesting that, that, uh, one of the students asked, how do you, um, <clears throat> how do you work not just with communities, but, you know, the huge teams where you say you have environmentalists and researchers and engineers and, and, you know, botanists and geneticists or whatever, I don't know, um, maybe not geneticists, but how, how, how do you organize that kind of work? It is a big organizational challenge. And, um, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, in what's called scoping and defining what we're going to do, how we're going to approach the work, um, coordinating the different team members and trying to anticipate when they'll be needed just to create a roadmap just to create a roadmap for the process. And in, in, in architecture, it's hard enough. In urban design, every project has its own life. And so we do need to stay flexible, but having that roadmap is really key. And some of the tricks of the trade are um, creating that roadmap in a way that's really visual and user-friendly. So not only can we understand it, we can share it with the client and we can even share it with different stakeholders. We can communicate with that as a tool to say, here's our process. And here's the look and feel. Here's where this, this group is plugging in. Here's where this group is plugging in. Um, and then of course, uh, we have to stay flexible as we go forward and update the process where we need to. Projects take twists and turns. Um, but I think that, that that kind of roadmap is, and always having a roadmap in mind is, is really key. 
And that's probably the most important organizational tool that helps us coordinate the different groups that are coming together. Part of part of what's what's happening though is, you know, as, as urban designers, I think you have to see yourself as a problem solver um, to really understand what it is you're trying to address within the project and to set up a process to facilitate experts that know more in these fields that are going to be critical to solving those issues. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, and I don't know, we've probably said it too many times, but the importance of holistic thinking, but really as a role as an urban designer, finding the ways to connect the dots that the relationship and findings from a botanist, a wetland specialist, and a hydrology expert tied to then someone who's focused on, you know, I don't know, energy. Um, there is a relationship there. And I think being in the position as sort of uh, the urban designer or master planner you have to test ways in which to connect those um, and to show the value of these areas of expertise. And I guess the last thing I'll say on that is many times we're in the position where we can synthesize all of that input into a series of principles. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know many times we put those to the side that the principles um, are great in terms of building consensus with community groups and other constituents. They're also a great way to manage a complex team because you're all contributing research and ideas to advance those principles. So in some ways it gives you a common ground in which to discuss these areas of deep scientific uh, or environmental research in, in a way that's easy for others to understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. We spend a good amount of time on that question of uh, accessibility to our work, to professional work. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go off topic a little bit and ask a question that occurs to me that maybe not specific to the any particular project, but to the scope of what you showed us today. I'm wondering if if you have been approached or you've thought about um, what they call no growth strategies or slow growth strategies, and has a city or I assume a client hasn't, but at least a city or some political entity has thought that that might be something that would be worth examining because even no growth requires planning and design. Again, there, there's a lot in there as opposed to just saying, yes, we've been part of that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Because it's, it, it's interesting how you define growth. So look at the city of Chicago. Population has been declining over the last 30, 40 years. Yet there is incredible capacity within the footprint of the city to maybe double the density, but you're not expanding the footprint. In fact, you may be finding more efficient ways to use the existing infrastructure and through the increased tax base, find ways to then fund public investments in schools, parks, and transportation infrastructure. So it's, it's growth, but it's not expanding the footprint of the city. And in certain Midwestern cities um, where there's been a population decline, that's an interesting way to think about it. We've also been involved in projects. Um, in fact, we're doing a study right now in, in Guangzhou, China, that is looking at the carrying capacity of the city. So before they determine how much growth can be projected, really understanding what is that carrying capacity, and it's more than just infrastructure. There's research that's being done around the ecological carrying capacity, how you can sustain habitat while at the same time intelligently uh, investing in places for people to live. 
uh, and in a way that's livable and um, kind of in balance. Um, but there are projects too where we've been involved where it has been about no growth and it's focused more on enhancing the quality of uh, the spaces um, within the cities. So a reinvestment in the infrastructure. I, I just wanna add to the conversation, the example of the Cook County Hospital project in Chicago, which is a project that we, uh, I mean, the building's 100 and, 110 years old. It's a Beaux-Arts 300,000 square foot building that was designed as a hospital, um, but was decommissioned in the late nineties and fell into extreme disrepair to the point where it was gonna be taken down and uh, really credit to the landmarks and preservation movement in Chicago that, that it was saved all the way to about 2015 when we, we competed uh, for the opportunity together with the developer to have access to that up 10 acres around it, a really key infill urban site that would, again, stitch together neighborhoods that were otherwise divided. And the building itself was part of the problem, this thing that needed to be taken down in order to allow for that neighborhood to be safe and functional or saved. And, and, and how could it possibly be saved? Um, it's not just designers who, we, we, again, we can't do this alone. Our, our, our team members on the development side after we'd envisioned the project and said, this is the most economical, efficient and highest and best use, we're gonna find a way to save this building and use all the tax credits and different kinds of things we can do creatively. They took it to 60 banks before they found funding. It took two years to find a development strategy that would pencil, that some, well, it penciled, but that someone would actually take a risk and fund. And, and once that um, funding was put into place, through a bank that was willing to take a risk on a, on a really neat project um, that was important to the city. Uh, we were able to do the work and then turn this building, which was falling apart entirely into a new use, which was a hotel that then unlocked further development. But that's a zero growth example. And that's a huge, um, a huge contribution to saving the carbon footprint of replacing that building, which you know exists in the physical terracotta brick masonry steel of that building. It's a big one. Um, and now exists as two really fantastic hotels that you know, take advantage of all the character giving elements of a, of a project like that and allow for further development um, to happen in an area that really needs it. There's, a, there's an inherent aspect of this that I think we should highlight, which is whether it's adaptive reuse mm -hmm. as in Cook County or conservation of resources and establishing the ecological carrying capacity, which cities like Toronto have done for years with their green belt in terms of growth boundaries to cities. Is, you know, I personally, kind of, and I saw some research um, that I think NYU had done that looked at the growth of cities over the last 30 years. And it wasn't as much about the increase in height and density within the core of the cities, as much as it was the expansion of the footprint of cities further and further out, that if you looked at the balance of where growth was happening, it was through expansion. And I think for us as urban designers, that's a real philosophical challenge because resources are finite and the footprint we leave through these projects it can be tough to replace or kind of redirect um, that impact. So it, it's a really important point. Now that's not to say reimagining the suburbs, redefining centers outside of the city center or polycentric cities. I mean, those are all really interesting conversations, but I think the general expansion of the urban footprint without reimagining conservation in this day and age is a real missed opportunity or would be a missed opportunity. I think that's especially the case just because of the, the massive costs and social costs of highways. Uh, at least mm -hmm. I know in the North America 
that's going to be a major hurdle still. Uh, we're not we're not over that um, yet. Um, I think the um, <clears throat> the related question to um, no growth or slow growth slow growth uh, is is more about how you've come into contact or interpreted different policy constraints in any particular cases. You've kind of hinted at some of them along the way. Um, and, and I guess it's a kind of a question of like, how many planners do you have on staff? The people who actually like reading these codes? Nope, nope, I'm, I'm, I say that in the best possible sense, that um, the, the policies and the decision-making frameworks uh, and all the kind of even half-written conventions that, that shape the, the urban planning and design culture of many cities, how, how do you, how do you get, <clears throat> how do you navigate those other, I mean, with staff, but also um, how are you, how's your organization set up to, to, to take on policy constraints, not just physical constraints? Well, it's a great question. We have about a hundred um, people in our, who are dedicated to our planning and urban design group. And that's globally plus or minus a hundred. Um, and it has a little bit of fuzzy edges because it's con we're constantly collaborating, even internally between architecture, landscape, um, our landscape practice, um, and even our interior design and engineering groups. But with about 100 planners and urban designers within that group, we have people with really different strengths and, and skill sets and interests. And some are very policy oriented and plannerly. And they're really more urban planners than they are urban designers. And we have other who are really coming from typically an architecture background and are really space makers, form givers and approach urban design uh, through the physical planning lens. And then we have a lot of people who are, you know, are really broad and integrators. Um, you know, what we do as a firm, we talked a lot about in some of our diagrams and some of our stories today, we talked about how we serve as a platform to bring together all these experts. And that's a big part of the role we play is synthesis and leadership of a project that is big and complex. And we also, in many cases, have a role in setting the vision, the physical vision, the images that capture everybody's imagination and show what's possible, the form giving, um, and often doing that in collaboration with other design leaders. But you know, we have, within our group of about 100, we have people who tap into every different part of this process. Uh, another dimension of this is, there's a interest because as urban designers, you your final deliverable isn't necessarily a working set of construction drawings. So how you deliver that vision in a format that allows the city to apply and further direct the vision um, ends up in some form of policy. Mm -hmm. And so we're very aware of that and start that conversation early on with whoever it is, if it's the community, if it's the private sector, if it's the city, what are the levers that we can pull? And a lot of times they will tell you, this is the hurdle we have to get across. This is legacy policy that we've not been able to address. Or for example, we really need a way to show how to link kind of urban form and density with quality public space through more than just a form-based code. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think having those conversations early will do two things. One is they will identify where you can through policy create greater value and impact. But also you're having that conversation early enough that it becomes embedded within the design. And just think about sustainability. It used to be you had cities requested a chapter on the sustainable strategies and recommendations you would apply. And it was the last chapter. It felt like an add on. We've come so far in that now the designs put forward because you know you need to think holistically in addressing climate change and carbon 
the design should respond so that it's less about enforcing policy and more about showing the vision and how you achieve that through integrated design practice. I do think, oh, sorry, Dave, one other thing I just put out there. And I, I think we would be very interested in sort of the work that school may be doing on this is around urban metrics. What are the new set of metrics that can be used for more performative driven policy um, that has real and meaningful impact? I think that's um, our metrics question I want to use, but um, I just want to make a note to everyone. Someone has, uh, one or two of you have raised your hands and I would appreciate it if you would type your question into the chat box. Thank you. Uh, getting back to urban metrics and performativity, um, you know, perhaps this is a kind of, uh, I hope you, this is not seen as confrontational, but um, metrics uh, have a tendency to leave out things like racial conflict or uh, gender imbalance or ethnic problems. I mean, metrics, um, I mean, if you talk to a sociologist, you may get certain metrics with respect to race relations. I'll just use that. But I haven't seen much of that in kind of the urban design field. Uh, some there's there is a whole thread in urban planning where they don't use the word urban uh, racial metrics, but they do take on the questions of um, racial justice and obviously the history of racial injustices in cities and how cities themselves are deeply entangled. City management and city regulation are deeply entangled in that history. And so I would love to know, I think we would all love to know how um, some kind of collective data gathering um, could inform us of such things that would be useful to you in a project or even if you're in Chicago to understand Chicago better outside, I mean, this is, you have to pay your own people to do this research. <laughs> um, so a couple interesting aspects to that. Um, first is we have been working and have had many conversations with the Mansueto Institute at the University of Chicago and uh, Luis Bentecourt and his work there, which as they look forward and looking at the same neighborhoods of which we're showing projects, what are the questions and indicators around human development that we need to be aware of? And that's access to education, safety, you know, other factors that through their own research are trying to define the indicators within the design of the community that would help positively influence that. So a great example was on one of those commercial corridors, starting to do a photographic analysis, but then overlaying it with other GIS data and sort of survey results when talking with the community of what the challenges were and looking for the patterns that emerge. So that could be a way to actually define a new set of metrics um, to see how you could benefit. And we also did another, that Lakeside project at the beginning we shared, uh, the School of Social Service Administration was, was interested in working with us to establish a baseline for the surrounding community. And what they found was aging population, no access to public transit, and increased uh, housing, but also increased housing costs, but also not having access to aging infrastructure. Because of aging infrastructure, they didn't have reliable heat, things like this. And they did this through sort of uh, mapping of the South Shore community adjacent to the site. That alone raised a number of provocations of, I mentioned working with technology companies, but 
if we're developing smart city concepts and infrastructure, shouldn't those be extended well into the community so that we could find new ways to provide health care to residents who don't have access to public transit to actually see or talk to their physician? It's kind of a fundamental requirement for health and well being. Could we find ways to connect residents more directly with job training through this infrastructure? But then also for building all new infrastructure out on site, don't design that or engineer that to be just for the million square feet out on site, but for the residents adjacent to the site that could benefit from more reliable, clean and affordable energy. So I, I don't know if that answered the question about metrics, but I do think there's other stones to turn over to kind of find these um, new opportunities through urban design. Yes, it's, um, I mean, uh, I think the question of measurement is, a, is in my mind, a, a way of also trying to get towards qualitative um, aspects of social life. And I respect the idea that we live in a world where things need to be measured. And that actually is not always a terrible thing. Sometimes measurement is part of the problem or classification is part of the problem historically. But um, I think, you know, professionally, it's a, it's a step towards um, a fuller understanding basically to expand what we consider to be necessary research in our field. Um, let's see, there was one more that came in. Someone asked a really interesting question um, about using the term introspection. Uh, how does a, a firm such as yours engage in introspection with respect to the history of your firm, but also even to just the practices of the past decade or five years. And I think specifically, not only for the racial questions I previously raised, but also about, about COVID and, uh, and, and post COVID, mm -hmm. assuming there is such a thing, uh, life. Uh, that's a great question. One of the things we do to kind of hold, hold together as a design firm, as a community in a way, um, as a way of unpacking what that, what, what is it that that one line mission statement means that we're a collective and we're trying to shape a better world? What does that really mean? Is we get together and talk about it. So, um, and we do that in different ways. We do that as an entire firm. We do that as a leadership group, setting the agenda for the firm, charting a course where we're gonna go next. Um, and we do it throughout the year regularly. We share the work um, the work that we're doing, our teams are doing with other colleagues and we talk about it, we critique it, we celebrate certain things. And of course um, it's done through, I think the different lenses we talked about today, we talk about what we're doing in ecology, what we're learning, try to share that environmental innovations so that we can start to build on the work in one project, even if, it's another team in another studio working in a different context. Hey, I heard they did that over there. I wanna hear about that. And then by, by talking and by having dialogue about the work we're doing um, and not just the work, but the culture we're creating internally and externally, um, we're able to do more and more of that, it's connect the dots. And that's how you build, you know, the innovation, it doesn't happen in huge breakthroughs that change everything. It happens project by project, bit by bit. Um, with an eye towards always building on what we've done before. And so I think uh, just the firm wide dialogue that we have is really important in constantly pushing the boundary of who we are, what we do and why, um, what we're proud of and where we wanna go next. And that is a firm wide conversation. Um, and, and into these dialogues, we often bring outsiders, people who are experts and we wanna hear from whether they're 
uh, scientists or McKinsey people studying cities and business. And, I'm not sure you want McKinsey in it right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> or, um, you know, ecologists, Sorry. people we work with. Um, and those, those people also push us and challenge us to think, think broadly about our work. And we do do research. Um, we do do our own research. It's a big part of our practice, actually. And often it's in partnership across sectors. So we'll do it, um, we'll do work with academics. We'll, we'll find partners with like interest and say, hey, let's do something together. And just find a way to um, dedicate some resources to making that happen so that we can learn or advance an idea. And uh, these times of coming together to talk about design are also time to share that work. And that's what we do and we do it regularly. Um, introspection is a, you know, sometimes a professional luxury. So I appreciate that. I've also read, I think it's SOM journal. Mm -hmm. Is that still running? Cause there's been some great articles there and I encourage people we, to take a look at your journal. The journal was an amazing initiative and we haven't had one in a few years. I think we got up to nine yeah. or so in about a dozen years. And the, the beauty of the journal was, you know, a lot of firms of our size, uh, do monographs. And SM has a history of doing monographs too, which are really self-published portfolios. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's self-edited, it's self-chosen. It's a, it's a kind of not unbiased presentation of your own work um, and that's okay, but it's not as self-critical as, um, as it should be. And therefore it's not a tool to um, really advance the kind of dialogue I was just describing which is at times self-critical or it's not useful. So um, we need to push each other. And what the, what, the monog what the journal did and the beauty of the initiative was that we actually handed the reins of this, a, a kind of monograph adjacent concept to an independent jury of people we knew would come from different disciplines, including the art world, the design world, uh, engineering, science, it would be diverse intentionally and it would be out of our hands. So we would, we would, we would almost have an internal, a bit of an internal competition, a call for really designs to be submitted. And then this group would critique them and they would be as critical as they would be celebrate, find themselves celebrating certain things and saying, Hey, this is really a miss and here's why. And then they would have dialogue and then we would do our best to publish that dialogue and invite articles, um, that would be written kind of, we would kind of have written around the body of work at that time. And uh, yeah, that was a great initiative, David. <laughs> um, you know, as an academic myself, I um, appreciated it, what is in fact a gray zone between academia and the profession and credibility, et cetera, that stem from working for a firm, but I think the journal did pretty well. Um, I have one last question because the students need a break before they go themselves off and discuss discuss you. Um, and this is a little bit more focused again on certain, certain particular issues, but I'll try to frame it more broadly. <clears throat> Essentially with climate change and with COVID-like events, uh, and, this person is asking about the basic concept of decentralization or polynucleated places or some kind of non-centralizing uh, systems. And do you come to the table with any particular position on that or on how you might think of local needs versus what you might call global needs? Yeah, um, I think it goes back to your opening question. It was about understanding an approach that locally resonates, respects, I personally, I think the, the land and the ecological integrity of the place in which you're building. That will inform kind of at a very early stage how to answer that question. Now, to the scale of exploration, what does 
a decentralized or polycentric approach mean in Malaysia will be very different than what it means in Detroit because of the cues you get from looking at the land and researching all of those other factors that create the frame for development. Um, and then there are cities that have strong existing cores that perhaps should be either reinvested or further invested in. You know, Chicago is a great example coming out of the pandemic. 20% occupancy during the pandemic and working very closely with city leaders on a reopening plan and what needed to be addressed from reactivation of ground floor, potential adaptive reuse of buildings to sort of this hearing from the city, their plans for public transportation, schools and public space. And then showing how those connect with tourism and culture, which is what draws so many people to live and work in downtown Chicago. So I, I don't think it's a singular answer. I think it's gonna be defined by the characteristics and challenges of that community in that place. I think one thing we can probably agree on is that the technology and, and culture and population growth are driving change faster than we can really keep up with. And the future of cities will bring some challenges. Um, decentralization near the top of the list that we're going to take on with the next generation of urban design. I mean, it's been, we haven't been alone in championing cities in being, you know, the biggest boosters of cities. And we've dedicated our professional lives to like so many on this call and and so many others to making them better. But, and I think that's, you know, gone in over the last few decades, that's really harmonized with some of the patterns we've seen in many parts of the world around reinvestment and repopulation of cities, even, even with the challenges we still face notwithstanding. But as we look at technology and where that's pushing us, um, in the near term and the medium term, over the next couple of decades, uh, we're gonna be working with forces and maybe against other structural forces that are gonna challenge us tremendously. Um, the good news is we have so much more knowledge and science uh, and general population understanding, not just in experts, but among the world, the population world, about um, the limited resources that we all have to share. And what, you know, what the cities look like that we're designing in 10 and 20 years could be very, very different from what we're talking about today. Um, and with that in mind, I think, David, your point about uh, the importance of research and projecting forward and expanding the boundaries of what it is we think is in our purview or what we should be applying our design processes and skills to take on should continue to expand because if we're only solving today's challenges, we're just gonna miss we're going to, it's going to be such a big mess about um, where we need to be uh, looking further ahead. I think that's the great challenge for the next generation. It certainly is, it, especially, you know, this question just about centralization or decentralization or dispersal. Mm -hmm. um, it's partially going to be, you know, choices that we have to make, not that we want to make uh, because of climate and because of the social costs and consequences of climate change, which will make some cities just impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something, you know, our program is mostly international students. And so I think from the, their point of view, uh, there's both a kind of urban design project that we look at as familiar, but then there's going to be something like regional design that requires that cities be, I don't know, shut down, reimagined. I mean, they don't have the luxury of doing that, but in fact, the threats are so huge um, that we'll have to kind of, uh, I don't know, that's why I have the Bucky map behind me. You know, we have to think at that scale. So I wanna, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. No, 
think big. Yeah. That's and small at the same time. So um, the students are going to break up into their discussion sections in a few minutes. And so I um, just want to thank you for uh, sharing your research with us and your projects. I mean, all the questions, as you can, you'll see if you read the chat, are kind of taken with the array of projects. And one person in particular wants to know about your streetcar extension project in Milwaukee. So you could send that information to me and I'll pass it along if you would be so kind. Sure. And um, what I think the students uh, really are, I mean, we as a program really want to encourage thinking about projects um, all over, even though this year has been no travel. So um, it's even harder to think globally, um, but it's a challenge that in fact is a, as a augurs the future where so much more of our work will be conducted in this Zoom-like or Miro-like atmosphere. Um, but um, I think you've covered a lot of ground today and we really appreciate it, understanding what a, a global practice uh, with historically um, profoundly important work, uh, how you're dealing with uh, the kind of ch changes that are you know, growing each day, you know, tomorrow something else is going to emerge. Um, but it's exciting to know that you're still plowing ahead and grasping onto what we can. Uh, so students, um, those urban design students, please uh, ask the hard questions in your groups and um, have a good discussion. And any of the general public here who would like to uh, submit further questions, feel, please feel free to email me, David Smiley, that's ds210 at columbia.edu, and uh, we'll pass it along. So uh, once again, thank you, <coughs> Doug and Adam, and we'll Zoom you later. Thanks, everyone. Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David and Kate. <laughs>